Hello and welcome to what is, I suppose, a bonus film in this series about um, energy and rates. Um, this one's been made in response to some questions that come up from the first film, um, mainly from people who want to know kind of how how can I tell by looking at the equation for a chemical reaction whether it's going to be endothermic or exo exothermic. So rather than looking at an energy level diagram and spotting whether that shows me a positive or a negative enthalpy change. How can I see that from a chemical equation? So hopefully by the end of this film we'll have seen some specific examples of processes which tend to be exothermic or endothermic so that we can spot these things when we see equations. Okay, we're going to start off with equations where the information is actually there right in front of us in the equation. Now, sometimes this will happen in the way that they will point out what the enthalpy change is directly by saying the enthalpy change is and then putting some number okay so if the enthalpy change is negative then we should be aware by now that that means we've got an exothermic reaction if it's positive it means we've got an endothermic reaction now if you notice in these two equations here at the bottom it looks like in both cases we've got a positive amount of energy okay so what do we do here because these two aren't both endothermic okay so let's have a look at what's actually going on right so if we look at here the difference between these two equations on in the first equation we've got this x kilojoules on the right hand side as a kind of product of the reaction here it's on the left as a kind of reactant okay so in this reaction we're being told that f and g turn into h and some energy is released okay so in other words this one is exothermic and in this one i and j require some energy to be added before they can turn into h so this is endothermic and it's just worth pointing that out because people can kind of get used to this positive and negative idea and then see plus energy in an equation and always assume it's endothermic but it depends whether it's a reactant or a product now let's have a look at a common chemical reaction that we might see in year 11 and that is burning how can you spot a chemical reaction that involves burning well quite simply you'll see oxygen as a react as a reactant because burning reactions are reactions with oxygen so if we see an equation that says something plus oxygen turns into some other things then we know that we are burning something this thing is going to get hot it's going to release a lot of energy so it's always going to be exothermic okay now the fact that the equation has oxygen in it isn't quite enough because if we see here we've got two equations one for photosynthesis and one for respiration now they've both got oxygen in them but again the difference here is that in one case it's a reactant and in another case it's a product and even if these equations didn't say where the energy was involved we should be able to figure out what's going on because in respiration we take sugar and we burn it we combine it with oxygen right so this releases energy that's why the energy is a product in this equation okay if we do the reverse well we can't do the reverse but plants can if they take carbon dioxide and water and turn it back into glucose and oxygen that requires energy so there requires an energy input here so both although both these reactions have oxygen in them they're not both exothermic because here the react the oxygen is a product rather than the reactant so it's only when we react things with oxygen that they will be giving rise to exothermic reactions we're not burning the carbon dioxide and the water here because the oxygen is a product okay moving on to some changes of state now this is often where some of the confusion creeps in however when we look at melting and evaporating so going from solids to liquids and from liquids to gases people often find it quite intuitive for example if I take a solid and the particles haven't got very much energy so they're kind of forced to stick to particular positions and I turn that solid into a liquid well I'm giving the particles more energy right so I'm putting energy in to melt something so this is going to be an endothermic process similarly if I turn a liquid into a gas and here's how we might see it in an equation rather than in pictures we've got the state symbols showing us this right again the particles don't have as much energy when they're as liquid as they do when they're a gas so I've got to put energy in to make that change of state happen and it's going to be endothermic 
often for some reason the melting one it seems intuitive to people we have to put energy in to turn a solid into a liquid but when we look at the reverse processes now so freezing and condensing people often get a little bit confused and that is often because they look at for example ice and compare it to water and they think to themselves well ice is a lot colder than water so if I freeze something this thing is going to be getting colder and so things that get cold they're endothermic reactions but the trouble is this is the reverse remember we said that melting was endothermic and this is the reverse of melting so we by that process of um, uh, deduction we would assume that this freezing process is exothermic so which one's correct well in fact it is exothermic if you think about it in terms of energy these particles have more energy here than they do there or the liquid has more energy than the solid so the liquid has to lose energy to become the solid so that energy has to leave it's going to be exiting it's an exothermic process okay you can just say to yourself if melting seems obvious to you that it's endothermic you can just say to yourself that this freezing process is the reverse and therefore it must be exothermic it might seem like it's getting colder but it's not getting colder of its own accord right for us to freeze ice we have to make it colder so we have to take energy from it if we're taking energy from it the energy is leaving it it's exiting it's exothermic okay so similarly for condensing here if we turn a gas back into a liquid it's always an exothermic process and this is true for all substances not just water although we've been talking about water here okay moving on to some other things which we might see in equations breaking bonds how does this equation show me that I'm breaking bonds well here I've this formula tells me that I've got two bromine atoms attached together in one molecule here I've got two of these things and each one of them is an individual atom so to go from here to here I've broken bonds okay and breaking bonds is always 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 an endothermic process it doesn't matter which bonds we're talking about okay so remember that likewise if we're making or conversely I suppose if we're making bonds then this is always going to be an exothermic process because it's the reverse of breaking bonds how might that appear in an equation well you might see atoms joining together to make molecules okay so making bonds is always exothermic breaking them always endothermic now people have asked how can I decide whether a, reaction, whether a reaction will be endothermic or exothermic without using these signposts that I've talked about so if we're not told the sign of delta H or if it's not obviously a burning reaction or if it's not easy to see whether bonds are being broken or made so let's have a look at this equation now here it looks like well to get these things to turn into those things I'm going to have to first of all break some bonds and then make some bonds now as we know breaking bonds is always endothermic and that can be seen on this energy level diagram here as I start from the reactants if I start breaking all these bonds I'm going to end up with separate atoms but to do that I'm going to have to put a lot of energy in so the chemical potential energy starts to rise until I get to this peak on my graph now at this peak I've got entirely separated atoms I've broken all the bonds up right now these separate atoms can fall back down this slope to the products why would they fall down well because I've got to make all these bonds and making bonds is always exothermic so the system will lose energy its energy will fall now if someone told me which data books do but which we don't have to do on the waste course right if someone told me how much energy was in each of these bonds then I could figure out the relative sizes of this uphill bit and the downhill bit and based on that I could decide whether the enthalpy change here was going to be negative or positive because if more energy is released by making these new bonds than was absorbed when we broke the old ones then overall the enthalpy change here will be negative and therefore it will be exothermic however as I've just said and as is written here and it's worth just emphasizing you don't have to be able to do this stuff on the waste course right so in other words you don't have to decide whether there's more energy 
in the bonds here or more energy in the bonds there or vice versa. You just have to be able to look at those signposts that we've been introducing in the rest of the film. So can you spot whether it's a bonding reaction? Can you see whether bonds were broken or made? Okay, so that's all we have to do. We need to know some common processes and be able to spot them when we see them written in the language of chemical equations. All right, now if there's anything there that doesn't make sense or if you've got any questions or comments, please feel free to come and see me or to post a comment on YouTube.